I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. One of the most historic gardens in America was cultivated by a man with many significant claims to fame. As the author of the Declaration of Independence and the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson was also a pioneering gardener. Now, although everyone back then gardened organically, Mr. Jefferson was one of the first to make the connection between healthy soil and plants. Monticello's 1,000 foot long kitchen garden is legendary for the variety and scope of its vegetable production. Although over 300 vegetable varieties were grown here, the emphasis was on using the garden as a laboratory rather than on the production for the dinner table. And much of what he learned is still in use today when it comes to sound organic gardening practices. Of all the people who have studied the life of Thomas Jefferson, the undisputed authority when it comes to his gardening experience is Peter Hatch. He's the director of Gardens and Grounds and has been digging into Mr. Jefferson's gardening life for over 33 years. Well, when Jefferson used the term garden, he was a uh reserving the term exclusively for his uh, vegetable or his kitchen garden that's here on the sunny southern slope of Monticello Mountain. It was carved out of the hillside by seven slaves that Jefferson hired from a Fredericksburg, Virginia farmer. And over a period of three years, uh, they hewed out this hanging garden uh, with a mule and a cart to distribute the earth to make this plateau. And uh, as Jefferson was about to retire from the presidency in 1809, he would write uh, um, almost daily to his overseer, Edmund Bacon, to get this garden done for his retirement. And this was really Jefferson's retirement garden. Uh, between the ages of uh, 67 and 82, uh, Jefferson would sow peas in this garden and uh, write in his garden book about how a salsify was harvested uh, some uh, 50 pounds on September 14th of 1817. So I think the garden was a recreational garden for Jefferson, but also very much an experimental garden. This was a, an American revolutionary garden in its scale and its scope a thousand foot long supported by a thousand foot long rock wall. Jefferson wrote that the greatest service which can be rendered in any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. And he cultivated in this garden some 330 varieties of vegetables and some 170 varieties of fruit in the uh, fruit, guard, fruit garden down below. What made the garden really remarkable, I think in some ways, was the fact that uh, uh, Jefferson assembled more vegetable novelties from the four corners of the earth, more so than any man had perhaps ever done so before. And I think that was probably Jefferson's great achievement was the fact that he tried all these different things, he wrote beautifully about them, and he really uh, participated so, uh, so avidly in the garden process. Uh, he would not only write down when he planted his peas, but he also write about when they sprouted from the ground, uh, when they flowered, when they started setting pods, and then of course, the really meaningful thing, when they came to table. Uh, so it's not only um, what Jefferson did, but also what it says about Thomas Jefferson about the gardening process. Uh, Jefferson, in many ways, was the first foodie in America, but also maybe one of the first gardeners in America. He really set a great uh, tone that, uh, whose legacy, I think, is still felt today. Now one of the things that made Jefferson a better gardener was his willingness to experiment with just about any plant he ran across. And this is one of them. Now I don't know if you recognize it because I don't see it in cultivation very often in my travels, but Jefferson grew this a lot. This is sesame. Peter, tell me about his discovery of this plant. He uses a lot of it, doesn't he? Yeah, well Jefferson was always looking for a really good salad oil for the preparation of his uh, beloved vegetables. And a lot of the olive oil that reached the United States was old, rancid, and expensive to purchase across the oceans. So uh, when Jefferson was president, he had a blind tasting of salad oils. And um, the general consensus was that the sesame was equal, even better, to olive oil. 
So that set off this great enthusiasm by Jefferson to plant sesame year in and year out uh, in the garden in order to extract uh, an oil from the seed pods. Speaking and, of the seed pods. Yep, they're right there. They're all over this plant. They're not quite ripe yet, but that's what goes on our McDonald's uh, hamburger bun. <laughs> they're pretty immortalized by um, right. our fast food world. Now, if these are riper, you'd be able to get it in them easier, but here they are. All these little seeds right there, those are the famous sesame seeds. And these grow well where? In what parts of the country? This well, is Virginia, obviously. Yeah, they like, they like hot, humid, um, long summers. And um, uh, Jefferson, thrive here. Jefferson uh, devised all sorts of uh, cleaning machines in order to extract the seed from the pods and the leaves. And he also, uh, he also devised all sorts of presses in order to extract the oil from the seed. So it was one of Jefferson's great enthusiasms that never really um, survived, perhaps as a commercial product in the southern part of the United States. But there was this movement, even through Congress, to pass laws encouraging the, the, uh, the cultivation of sesame oil in the southern states of the United States. That's very interesting. On the note about keeping the garden going, there were a lot of challenges up here just like there are today, but here he didn't have any irrigation, and then we had the pest and disease issues, but talk about some of those. Well, Jefferson wasn't afraid to fail. Uh, if you look at his garden book, it's amazing to see um, the repetition of the word failed time and time again. And you could perhaps say the few gardeners failed as often as Thomas Jefferson, or at least um, confessed to failure as unrelentingly as he did. And water was a great problem here on the top of the mountain. It's a hot garden. Um, surely pests were a problem, but. Jefferson garden in sort of an age of innocence before a lot of our worst pests had come in to um, become problems. But Jefferson believed in the, um, uh, the importance of building the soil. Um, one year uh, when he was serving as Secretary of State in Philadelphia, he got a le letter from his daughter, Martha, saying that the um, insects were ravaging her cabbage plants as fast as she could set them out into the garden. So Jefferson responded by saying, well, the problem with the plants is they're growing in lean soil. He said that winter the two of them would cover the entire garden with a heavy coating of manure. He said when plants are growing in rich soil, they will in turn, in Jefferson's words, bid defiance to all sorts of pests, droughts, diseases, and all the problems that, um, that attack us now in the summertime in central Virginia. So Jefferson had this sort of, uh, he said in gardening, it's the failure of one thing that's repaired by the success of another. So he had this belief in this, uh, uh, this nice relationship that exists between wild nature and the garden. Uh, sometimes today we think of gardening as being almost like war. And we use military images to describe the gardening process. We're out to wipe out these bugs or destroy these weeds. So it's really nice to fall back upon Jefferson's more balanced belief in this inevitable tension that exists between the garden and the natural world. And the things that worked back then are the same things that work today. Right, building the soil was an important concept for Jefferson. And um, still today, um, you know, we cover the garden every year with um, a heavy coating of some sort of organic matter, or compost or rotted leaves or manure or uh, whatever we can find because it's a, it's a key ingredient to growing healthy, strong plants. Indeed it is. Look at those tomatoes. Those are really healthy. So Jefferson had a lot of help with a garden of this size, of course, but tell me about Jefferson as a gardener. How much time did he actually spend out here? One of his uh, slaves, Isaac, um, after Jefferson died, left an oral history of his life here at Monticello, and he said that Jefferson would uh, work at a right hard pace in the cool of the evening. Um, so Jefferson was sort of a gentleman gardener. He actually did you know, plant things himself. This is reflected in the details of the garden book, but also uh, one of his friends recalled how there was this uh, portable seed stand that was carried from site to site and on it were hundreds of vials and tin canisters of seeds and Jefferson would select them and actually sow the, uh, uh, sow the vegetables himself. He also was a pioneer in doing things like extending the season because in certain parts of the country you, know, you only garden during certain months. Right. He gardened all the time. This is a remarkable microclimate, this garden. Um, it's a very, very warm garden that enabled him to extend the season well into the fall and winter months. And, um, often we don't have a frost until well into uh, November or December. But also in the springtime, because the, the warm air settles, rises up over a hillside, the elevation of Monticello, the cold air settles down below. Jefferson uh, never had a frost that hurt his fruit trees, and he would commonly gloat over the fact that his neighbor's fruit trees were all killed by frost while his own remained unscathed. And that's because of the siding of this garden. A lot of the cold air, or all of it, just basically went past it. Right. It settled down below, and the warm air would rise up here on cold nights, and um, uh, so the flowering fruit trees would, uh, would avoid frost. And that's a really important concept when you lay out a garden or an orchard. Yeah. 
Well, it's just impressive that a lot of the things that he did way back then, about 200 years ago, are still principles that we can apply today for garden success. Oh, for sure. Um, Jefferson, I think his, uh, his enthusiasm was perhaps his most, um, his greatest legacy. But also the fact that um, uh, in food and wine and, uh, and, uh, and uh, gardening, um, Jefferson did a lot of things that I think um, set a foundation for what we do today. Yeah. Uh, from buying produce from the markets in Washington, D.C. when he was president to um, uh, improving the soil with organic matter here in the gardens at Monticello. He was certainly a man ahead of his time, wasn't he? He was. You've seen designs like this before, and just perhaps you've wondered how it's done. Well, wonder no more. Pat Berdowski is Monticello's head gardener, and you don't get that title without knowing a thing or two about recreating these historical designs. Thomas Jefferson was inspired by so many different things for his garden. What were some of the things that he was inspired by? Well, we know that he read Roman literature. He was very schooled in the classics. He read it in the original languages. His architecture is based on Grecian and Roman um, uh, styles. And so we know he'd also read the uh, Roman treatises on how to garden because they were fabulous gardeners. All of the gardening in his time frame would have been based in Roman agricultural methods. So his garden was laid out with squares with grass paths between. And we are going to lay out a garden. We're going to lay out a quincunx in using basil because you can see the pattern. It's an efficient pattern in which things are staggered. A quincunx pattern is basically a way of stagger planting in your planting bed. And we are going to use a string line and we're laying that across the whole planting bed. Then we're taking our compass and making sure that it is perpendicular to our path. And then we're gonna place the plants underneath the string line. And we're gonna place them, in this case, 20 inches apart. Once that's done, and all of our plants are laid out underneath the string line, it's time for us to plant them. Once they're planted, we take the string line and move it along to the next row. This is when it's also important to use a compass because our next line is now gonna be perfectly parallel to each other. We run the string line 20 inches away from our first row and then lay the plants out, now spacing them in a staggered formation, still 20 inches apart. Once we're done planting, it is a beautiful diamond pattern and it's a great Roman way of planting your garden. One of Thomas Jefferson's favorite things to do during all his worldly travels was to collect seed. He'd send them back to his garden, grow out the crops, and for those that were successful, well, he would save the seeds and then share them with his friends. He'd also do something with the lettuce seed, right, Pat? Every Monday morning, he would grow a thimble full of lettuce from April until October. Excellent, and that would give him fresh lettuce every week all through the season. All through the season. How did he do it? Because it's a pretty easy process. To save the seed from lettuce, yes, all you do is take your lettuce head, and when it starts to go up to a point, you let it go, and it'll flower. And it's amazing, it gets to be about three or four feet tall. And the flowers, these are the dried flowers. Mm -hmm. The flowers, when they bloom, they make seeds under each, uh, under the petals. And what we need to do is extract those seeds out from the, um, the dried, the dried lettuce. So, once you've dried your lettuce. Yeah, we don't have to do that by hand though. There's an easy process for that. Yeah, so you take your lettuce and it's easy enough to make screens. Uh-huh. This is just hardware cloth around underneath a frame that anyone can make at home. This is a wider version of this. And uh, we put this, the lettuce in to get rid of all of that large material. So you just kind of rub it through the wire and what comes through crush will be, it. crush yeah. it, yeah, would be the seed, right? The seed will drop through. Okay. And all those stems and leaves will disappear. Got it. Now, this is another version of the same thing, more of a commercial model, right? Yes, this is the this is the, a large mesh screen here, and underneath is the smaller screen that's catching the seed. And there's a third one that catches all the the uh, dust. That that's my third one. Keeps your third one. Well, we're making a mess on the table. Okay. That's right. All right. So now we end up with seed and chaff in there, right? Right. And so we need to get rid of the chaff. And the old process of winnowing, you can either put it in the air or you can blow with your mouth on a Go plate. For it. So if you put this on a dish, okay. and this is a paper plate, it kind of catches some of the uh, seeds from drifting away. You can see the seeds are exposed already. And the little black dots the little there. little black dots. Uh -huh. So all we need to do is 
give it a little blow and we'll get rid of the we'll get rid of some of this big stuff first and then all you need to do is puff and this, the and chaff starts to go okay and you start getting a lot of seed on the plate <laughs> I like you. to take the shortcuts I'm you know I don't have time for all this <laughs> and if you're just saving it for yourself you could plant it with the chaff it doesn't yeah. make any difference that's true but eventually it's very nice to have just the seed especially if you're gonna share it with friends. And it doesn't take much to get a lot of seed out of here. You consider what you get in a pack of seeds for a few dollars. This is easily that and right. it's free. Um, and just from what we have right here, we can probably do a whole season's worth. Season I'll show you, we have uh, done some seed perfectly uh, cleaned and uh -huh. there you have it. Wow. And then to store it, you wanna have it in an airtight container, a jar or a, you know one of these little tubs and put it in the refrigerator. Make sure you label it and what year it's from, and then you know how old that seed is. Lettuce will say, stay one or two years really well, but we can grow it up to five or six years. The germination just declines as, as it gets older. Great way to keep your garden growing season after season and an easy and inexpensive way to do it. Absolutely, you take one package of seed and you can make row after row of, of new plants. Thanks, Pat. All right, time to make some more. Right, I think I got this down. You know, Thomas Jefferson, smart man. Good dresser, too. And he also knew how to run a darn good country. But he also knew how to eat really great organic produce. The man loved himself some peas. So just imagine what you can do. Grab some peas, chomp on it. One of the best things I know how as far as preparation of peas, let's do a stir fry. Now the great thing about stir fries, you can use pretty much any vegetable you have in your kitchen. Carrots, celery, we got these peas, red onions, things you already have. Don't throw them away or let them wilt. We're gonna make this delicious and quick stir fry. One of the first things I'm gonna do, well, let's peel some stuff. We got these carrots already peeled and also some of this fresh broccoli we have as well. So we have the carrots, we have the broccoli, just a quick chop. And when you're doing stir fry, you wanna do a really thin chop, really thin so it cooks really fast. So now we're just about ready. Chop the onion, a little bit of red pepper for flavor and color. It's time to cook. All right, so how about a little bit of crunch? Major crunch, in fact. We'll grab some of this celery. So we're just about ready. Red onion, garlic, ginger. Then we're ready. So we have just about everything we need to get started. We're gonna use a large saute pan. If you don't have a wok, don't even worry about it because I don't have a wok either. So large saute pans work better than woks. Big pan, big heat. All right, now while that's heating up really hot, the thing about stir fry to keep in mind, you don't wanna throw all the vegetables in at the same time. You actually wanna cook them separately. The things that cook pretty quickly will cook just a little bit and push them off, put them in a bowl, and then we'll cook the other things that take a little bit longer. So at the end of cooking process, everything's crunchy and full of flavor. All right, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. What are the first things I'll add? Let's get that onion going. That is music to my ears. It's like Monticello, amazing acoustics in that joint. You gotta go visit. The next thing in, we're gonna add some of the celery, some of the quick quick cookers in this family, all right? Next thing in, those red peppers. They're pretty fast cookers. They go in, give it a quick toss. Joe is very good at this, this whole stir fry move. And then the peas go in there. They don't take a long time to cook. Sugar snap peas, snow peas, regular shucking peas, whatever you got. Thomas Jefferson, he knew himself some peas. So we'll throw them in too. We don't want it to cook too terribly long, probably 20 to 30 seconds. But while that's cooking, what do you do? How about homemade teriyaki sauce? Here we go. A little bit of soy sauce. This is what we have right now. To it, how about some of this gorgeous local honey? $4 for this whole thing of honey with the comb. There we go. And all we do is stir that in there. Kids, homemade teriyaki sauce, that's all it takes. 
Now this looks not cooked all the way through, just kind of par cooked, it's still crunchy. Let's get this out of the pan and into this bowl. And now come the big daddies, the types of vegetables that take a little bit longer to cook. And that's where this broccoli comes into play. The broccoli does take a little bit longer to cook than some of these other things, like the snow peas and such. Get a little bit of heat. And then, of course, the carrots. They take a little bit longer to cook as well. Now, it's a little bit dry in there right now, so I'm gonna add a touch of moisture. And from this moisture comes homemade chicken stock, okay? Homemade chicken stock, it's so easy to make. Growing at greenerworld.com, you'll find my recipe right there for you. We're gonna add homemade chicken stock to this. That helps it steam, get it cooking just a little bit faster. Oh yeah. All right, there's a little bit of moisture in there and I don't think all of it's gonna kick out. So how about a homemade sauce? Easy, super easy. We're gonna make cornstarch slurry. This is cornstarch, add a little bit of water until it forms a paste. There we go. And the cornstarch kind of thickens the whole thing up and makes a delicious sauce with that chicken stock. And that's just about done, guys. We'll add the vegetables back in and we'll serve the whole thing up. A quick toss. You see how the sauce thickens up over the top? And I haven't added any salt or any pepper just yet because that's where the saltiness from this, the homemade teriyaki sauce, comes into play. Just like that. Oh, delicious. Oh yeah, now all these flavors are evenly coated in that homemade teriyaki sauce, and it's nice and thick because of that cornstarch slurry. A little bit of oh, brown rice, delicious. Look at that sauce. Now that looks amazing. We'll top this off with some fresh bean sprouts. And how about some fresh cilantro? Right over top like that. Quick, simple, easy, and delicious. Thomas Jefferson, you would have been proud. Reaping the fruits of your labor in great dishes made with organically grown food, fresh from the garden, certainly makes the gardening experience all the sweeter. In spite of the many challenges, Thomas Jefferson showed us that the failure of one thing is always replaced by the success of another. Some things never change, especially when it comes to making a healthy garden. Just like Thomas Jefferson proves by focusing on the basics. Such as creating and maintaining healthy soil with compost and manure. There's a lot more to learn about Jefferson's organic gardening life. And we've assembled some articles and great links on our website to learn more. You can also view past episodes and watch Chef Nathan's cooking videos and recipes. And the website address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Patty Moreno. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Now, let's go look at that garden one more time. Yeah, one more. Small as sin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot easier if you have a little contraption That's one way to like do it. this. <laughs> this is um, this is a, a sieve system. There's a, a thick. Show me. Big... All right. Weird stuff. You know Thomas Jefferson, brilliant, brilliant man. Knew how to run a country, start a country. Probably dressed really well as well. No, that's pretty funny. But I should already know that information. The man did dress well. Where is that coming from?